Spirit. And bless me in his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Please join me in the Collect for Purity at the bottom of the page. Almighty God, God, to you all hearts are open, all desires are known, and, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Christ our Lord. Amen.
Grant to us, Lord, we pray, the spirit to think and do always those things that are right, that we who cannot exist without you may by you be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is a story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any, of, any other of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to the pasture, their father's flock, near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him out of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our reading from Psalms, Psalm 105, and we shall read responsibly by half verse. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Among the Sing to him, sing praises to him. And speak all his marvelous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and his strength. Continually seek his face. Remember the marvels he has done. His wonders and his of his power. O offspring of Abraham, his servant. O children of Jacob, his chosen. Then he called for a famine in the land, and his sword of his supply of bread. He sent a man before them. Joseph was the soul of his slave. They bruised his feet in fetters. His neck they put in an iron collar. Until his prediction came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. 
He set him as a master over his household, as a ruler over all his possessions, to instruct his princes according to his will, and to teach his children wisdom. Hallelujah. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one who believes with the heart and is so justified, and one confesses with the mouth and, is, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is the word of the Lord.
faithful in that endeavor and faithful in our endeavor to serve you all the days of our lives. Amen. 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 Please be seated. So on first glance, it might not uh, seem that way, but all of the, the readings, including the psalm today, are about uh, humility and obedience to God. Humility and obedience to God. Um, starting with Joseph, uh, it doesn't seem like <laughs> humility is the order of the day. It seems like murder and nastiness is the order of the day. Uh, but we hear, and some of you may remember, many of you I hope may remember, that when they call him, let's kill this dreamer, uh, they're not talking about just a dreamy, kind of dopey, look up in the sky, ooh, there's a butterfly, kind of a dreamer. They're talking about uh, Joseph, the dreamer, who has dreamed two dreams recently in which he is elevated above, he's the youngest one, elevated above his brothers in the first dream. He dreams of the wheat uh, kneeling down before him, the sheaves of wheat, the number of his brothers, and he goes and tells them, you know, I'm going to rule you all. And then he dreams of the sun and the moon and all of the stars bowing down before him, which uh, he interpreted and his family also interpreted as his father and mother and all of his brothers bowing down before him. And so dream predictions and interpretations can be tricky. You can think that they mean one thing, and they can, in all actuality, be pointing you towards something else. Because as we know, Joseph is taken by his brothers for some um, pretty bratty behavior, but you know, thank goodness for Reuben, right? The voice uh, in the wilderness that says, uh, let's not kill him. And then the goodness and the kind heartedness of Reuben, thinking that he's gonna sneak back later and get Joseph out of that pit and take him home um, and maybe give him a good talking to on the way. Uh, but instead, the, the brothers, Reuben is not there, and the brothers decide to sell him into slavery, which, he, which happens for him. Uh, and as you know, he goes into slavery, and then eventually he becomes, uh, because of his wisdom and his ability uh, to think and, and interpret dreams, he becomes a leader in the household of that pharaoh. Uh, and he is given uh, great power. And so his dreams come true in a way, but they don't come true in the way that he thinks. He is sent there basically by God in order to have the ability to serve his family when they come to him in need. And so when they bow to him, it is in their need, their hunger because of the great famine in the land, and his use, and the only true good use of power is to serve them. Uh, and we learn that from Christ, that the greatest gift of having the ability uh, to, uh, to enact in the world that other people cannot is, your, is, is matched by your ability to be able to serve those who need it the most. Uh, and so there is that piece of it. And then we have Jesus, who is... Um, overwhelmed at this time. So this is immediately following the feeding of the 5,000 plus. So we know Matthew tells us 5,000 men and women and children. So there's probably 10, 15, 20,000 people there that he feeds with those five loaves and those two fish. Uh, and that, that he is in the fullness of his power as God's agent in this world, as God in this world. And he could literally probably have just continued to stand there and heal the thousands as they continue to come. Because what we know in this scripture is that he and the disciples have been healing throughout the land. And people, every time they try to go somewhere and rest or work together and, and look at scripture together, uh, the crowds find them. And right now, they are literally backed up against this lake, against the sea, where uh, there's nowhere else for them to go. Uh, and, and, and in Matthew's Gospel, he, he, he teaches a little bit from that boat uh, in this water. So, uh, but he could stand there and let the crowds come to him. And thousand by thousand by thousand eventually just heal the world. His disciples would drop and die from human exhaustion. His human body that he holds in may drop at some point. 
but he could do that. He could be lost in ego and power of doing that. But he knows where his power comes from and to whom he owes his allegiance. And so he does something that many of us in our, I, I had a meeting this morning, um, and, and uh, I'm not going to identify them but because I'm one of them, but I had a meeting this morning with a bunch of Thai bays, and we would literally work ourselves uh, and, and, and get excited about it uh, until, until we had nothing else to do, and we're snapping at everybody around us uh, because we get too exhausted. And Jesus kind of got to that point today. What does it say he did? He sent the disciples to the other side of the lake in the boat, and he dismissed the crowds. He got to that point. And what I wonder uh, about is, is how he needed to learn in his humanness, uh, as we all need to learn, what are our limits? How far can we take that before, uh, and just give and give and give before we snap? Um, and, 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 but Jesus, even in that place where he continued uh, to heal and to feed those people, he made sure that they had what they needed enough. They had enough. And then he sent them on their way. And then he took care to pay attention to the tension of needing and all this want in the world and his own need to recenter himself in, into his sacred center with God. Um, and it seemed he had a difficult time getting to that place this time. So I wonder about you. What do you do? How do you, how have you learned in your life, or maybe not learned yet, what your limits are? How far can you go, and where do you start seeing those, uh, those little signals that let you know in a couple of days, the next person that says, hi, good morning to me, is going to get, what do you mean it's good morning? You know, uh, how do you know when you are edging up to that place and you need to take some time uh, and back off and stop whatever it is that you are pouring yourself into too much? Um, so instead of succumbing to this, to the, to the glory of his ego, instead of feeding that ego's power, he feeds the power within him that is meant to serve and do it well. Uh, and the glory of ego is what it would have been if he stood there and just let people keep coming to him like some um, uh, televangelist kind of a person. Uh, and there's some good ones, but you know some of them are not. Uh, but he does, he does something so many of us would not do. He takes the time to rest and pray. And he sends the disciples and he sends the crowds away. And then he, um, he spends the rest of the night up on this mountainside in seclusion and in prayer. His favorite place, it seems to be, is always a garden uh, or a mountainside or along a path or the wilderness, which is what he did at the beginning of his ministry, where he could just be truly surrounded by creation and the beauty of God's world and, and connect in that way in his, in his quietness uh, to God. And he does that in humility and faith. He does that so that he can do well what he has come to do and not just keep hammering away uh, at the world with no, with no rest. And so it's only after he's rested that he goes to the disciples. And here's what happens. He is really well rested. So in the night, the storm comes up and it's early in the morning and the disciples are out there being battered by the waves and the wind and the lightning and the storm. And Jesus just walks along through all that, the calm in the center of the storm. Uh, and we are meant to be reminded of, of Psalm 77, which we did not have this morning, but Psalm 77, 19, one of the verses says uh, uh, the I am, which is what he tells them. He says, do not be afraid because I am, it is I. Um, we're meant to be reminded of that Psalm that says, that I am provides a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, leaving footsteps unseen. And so the disciples and, and we, the listeners in Matthew's community, are meant to, to connect. Peter makes that connection first, doesn't he? As soon as Jesus says, I am, be calm, uh, Peter comes out of it. He snaps out of it first. 
And what does he do? He goes immediately to that place where he knows that the only one who this could be is the Son of God who he has just seen, most recently and forgotten about already, uh, in the Transfiguration on top of that mountain. So he sees Jesus revealed to him again here on the water. And he says, if it is you, so there's still a little bit of doubt, right? If it is you, tell me to come and I will come. And Jesus says one word, the same word that God has given to Moses, the same word that he gave to the disciples, come, just come. And Peter gets out of the boat and goes to him. But then Peter does what we all do, and, it, and, and, he, and he steps out and then he thinks, what am I doing? And he looks around and then he begins to sink. And after he begins to sink, then he becomes frightened. At first he's not, he's just kind of looking around, but, but then, he, then he begins to sink. And then he is frightened. And what does Jesus do? Jesus immediately, just as he immediately said come, and gave Peter what he wanted, he does not ask Peter to prove anything to him. Peter calls out for help, Lord save me, and he does. He just reaches into that water and in probably the most loving way possible, um, you know, oh you, you know, just like we would, you know, if, 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 what, if a family member like tripped over something, it's like, oh, you know, didn't you see that? Um, come and he pulls him out of the water. And Peter had begun that journey and finishes it with the knowledge, and this is something I really love. I want to share this. This is uh, Stanley Howard Wass, and so I'm going to look down here and find this. Um, Stanley Howard Wass says two things about this gospel that caught me. First, uh, it's not Jesus' miracles that make it hard for people to believe in him. It's not the miracles that make it hard. What makes it hard to believe in him is our unwillingness to give up our prideful presumption that we are our own creators, that we are our, our, our own creators, and that nothing that can be done in this world uh, is beyond what we can do. So we, so we find it hard to believe in the things that Jesus did sometimes. And secondly, that Peter began his journey across the water towards Jesus with the recognition that that belief and that ability to do what he's asked to do is not something that he can do on his own initiative. Peter's faith is little, but he is at least beginning to recognize, how Hawass says, that faith is obedience. Like Peter, we are frightened sometimes. But our fears are not governed by our fear of God, and God is the only one that we should truly ever be afraid of. Our fear, like Herod, uh, is of the opinions of others. We fear the opinions of other people more than we fear God. And as a result, we sink beneath the weight of our desires, hoping that others will see us as what they deem is normal. It's so true. He's amazing, powerless. Jesus to you. <laughs> um, but followers of Jesus are people who refuse to live in a world that has no miracles in it. Followers of Jesus refuse the assumption that the incredible, the beauty, the wonder of what Jesus has brought to this earth, the healing, the focus, the togetherness, the uh, the beauty that we can impart in it, we refuse to believe that that cannot happen. We believe that it can. And so we are not normal. And it's okay to not be normal. Was that really confusing? See me at coffee hour trying to explain it. Um, followers of Jesus cannot be normal because we believe in Jesus. We believe in his ability to change our lives and our ability through that, through our obedience to his way, to change the world. In my family, it was a mark of, of pride. Uh, if we came home uh, after school sometime, 
if we came home after school sometime and our, and our mom, and we told our mom, so-and-so called me weird. And my mom would say, that's fantastic. You are not a sheep. I'm so glad. You know, and so we would be, <laughs> we would be praised because we got called weird. I did that for my daughter and she's awesome. So isn't it reassuring to know that it's great to be weird and not normal? To be a believer in the Christ. Um, I think it's a pretty freeing thing for a person of faith. Because we don't have to go the way other people tell us that we have to go. We only have to go the way that God has laid out for us. The path in the center of the storm that is almost always surrounding us in some way. To know that there's this abundance of love that never, ever gives up on us, like Jesus never gave up on Peter, is powerful. And I want to finish with one thing. Uh, oh, good, I'm doing okay. I want to finish with one thing, um, and it's not uh, directly related to this, but I read it this week and I really liked it. And so I'm gonna give this to you because I think it's a little gift, a little love gift. This is, uh, was written by uh, Fodor Dostoevsky in the Brothers Karamazov, okay? So this is what, that's a great moral uh, tome if you ever wanna read it, but he says, love every leaf, love the animals, love the plants, love everything. If you love everything, you will perceive the divine mystery in things. Once you have perceived it, you will begin to comprehend it better every day, and you will come at last to love the world with an all-embracing love. We make it our mission to love everything. Then we become love. I think it does kind of fit, doesn't it? Okay. Um, now, with that, let us stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nice Lord. We believe in one God, the Father, the, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in the one Lord of Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, God from God. Light from light, true God, true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us, for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became the monarch of the Virgin Mary, and we made him. For our sake, he was crucified at the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism of forgiveness of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people will follow form three, found on page 387 of the Book of Common Prayer. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Jose, our bishop, Bishop Raphael, and Rim Bishop for the Diocese of Cuba, Aaron, our priest, Carrie, our aspirant, and Katie, Michael, Julia, and Robert, our musicians. We pray for the Diocese of Europe, for Iglesia Anglicana de Chile, 
for all students, faculty, and staff returning to school. We pray especially for Dr. Jim Tippy, Joseph Davis, Ben Davis, Eliza Davis, James Tippy, and Sharice Tippy. We pray for the college and campus ministries of Appalachian State, Western Carolina, and UNC Asheville. And Montreat for Dr. Jim Tippy. And Montreat. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. We pray for Joe, our president, Roy, our governor, and Steve, our mayor. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. For those on the island of Maui dealing with the wildfires. Give to the departed eternal rest. The light of perpetual shine upon you. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray for those in our community who are serving in the military especially for Ben, Michael, Philip, Grayson, Gavin, Jared, Jade, Nicholas, Perry, and Chuck. We pray for those who struggle with disappointments, with financial insecurities, with grief over lost loved ones or lost dreams. We pray for the relief of pain for those whose bodies and hearts ache. We ask for healing for all who suffer. We especially pray for Melchor Tomas, Margaret Hale, Jim and Connie Bergen, Phoebe and Jim Rockmore, Patrice Luther, Jim Wallace, Ann Allen, Kathleen Buchanan, Barbara Acri, Katie Rockmore, Maureen and Don Trike, Bob Monte, Sandy Rabb, Russell Johnson, Jim Currow, Tina Orling, Mitch Gillespie, Ricky Hart, Chris Tipton, Amanda Cook, Jim Haney, Joy, Reese Smith, Nancy Long, Charles Foreman, John and Teresa Nichol, Fred Boyd, and all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Please stand if you are not already doing so for the peace. And the peace of the Lord be always with you.
Katie Warren. Um, a couple of announcements. Uh, the, uh, the first meeting of the planning for the, what are we calling it? Uh, Winter Fest Celebration of the Arts. Now it's Winter Fest. Well, we had two ideas. <laughs> I liked the Winter Fest. Well, the Harvest of the Arts that we're going to do. The, uh, the first meeting was this morning. Thank you uh, to those who came and, uh, and, and helped me uh, uh, kind of come up with an idea. We are thinking, uh, and so you all need to think about this. We are thinking December 9th, which is a Saturday, uh, early in December before everything gets too crazy, uh, from about 9 to 3 or sometime in, on, on that day uh, to do a Harvest of the Arts. Um, we are uh, encouraging all of you who uh, create uh, original works, whether they are craft oriented or fine art oriented or uh, the word, uh, the, the works of your words or music or whatever it is that you do that you would like to share with our community so that we can celebrate you and your art and that maybe you can also um, uh, sell a little bit, you know, and make that. Uh, thing uh, we're going to do it as two things a celebration of our art and a fundraising thing so uh, things that are sold or something like that we're looking at a 10 or 15 percent goes back to the church from that uh, if you know people uh, who are artists or craftspeople in any way shape or form or who are uh, musicians or poets or playwrights or anything like that encourage them to come because we're going to make space for all of these things. And we're gonna have a time for, especially those people whose, um, whose art is, is, is expressed outward, uh, to, to share that art with us for a, a minute or so, a couple, about five minutes each uh, at that thing. And it'll be, it should be fun. So uh, think about that. We have a deadline uh, in November of you letting us know that you wanna be part of it. And so that we could do it in December. But if you happen to know any reason why December 9th would be a tragic day for this community to try to have something that big, please let us know. So would you mind standing up if you're on that committee? I know that you're going to out yourself as a type A personality. But, you know, so the people that are on that committee, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so far, and if you would like to be on that committee, uh, please let us know. Uh, the other thing is that Katie uh, Suva and Kim Suva I will. Uh, Katie and Kim Suva are down in the parish hall doing uh, a really special coffee hour for us today. So you're invited uh, to coffee hour for that. And uh, I want to say one thing and then I'll let you go, Laura. Um, the trivia team tied for first place this time. Yay! We didn't get the gift certificate because there was a tiebreaker, but we tied for first place and all that matters. And my very competitive self feels good about that. So, <laughs> uh, okay, Laura. It seems like to me that the pottery market is usually that second. I just check it out. It's the second. Yeah, 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 are there other announcements for the good of the community that I have missed up? Uh, I do want to say the birthday prayer because Ann Allen uh, had her birthday this past week, and I, and I think we missed her out last time. And, uh, and I want to say the traveler's prayer. So if you'll turn in your prayer books. Uh, the birthday prayer is... Uh, on 3, 8.30, and the Traveler's Prayer is 8.31. And so we're going to pray. The Travelers will be uh, Jim and Carice Tiffy. Jim is taking Carice to school up in South Dakota this week. Or, right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for the birthday for Ann Allen. Are there other birthdays that I don't know about? Or anniversaries that are happening this next year? Okay. Uh, God, our times are in your hands. Love of good favor, we pray on your servant Anna, as she begins another year. Grant that she may grow in wisdom and grace, and strengthen her trust in your goodness all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
offering to God.
Page 369, Prayer C. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets and their forces, and this fragile earth, our island home. From your will, they were created and have their being. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the stewards of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for we are your Again and again you called us to return through prophets and sages. You revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood he reconciled us, by his wounds we are healed. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. <laughs>
Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Enveloped in God's light, may you be a beacon to those in search of light. Sheltered in God's peace, may you offer shelter to those in need of peace. Embraced by God's presence, may you be present to others. And may that blessing of all of those things be with you through the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, this day and always. Amen.